Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I should perhaps, uh, everybody knows Nigel, but everybody should uh, perhaps also know who I am. Uh, my name is Henry Bolton. I'm a former police officer. I headed the International Police in Central Croatia. I've led intelligence operations and operations to disrupt transnational organized crime targeting the United Kingdom. I was the head of the Board of Security and Management of the world's largest security arrangement, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which actually has nothing to do with the European Union. It has 56 member states, now 57. I served 27 months in northern Helmand, Afghanistan, leading coalition efforts in the northern districts of Helmand in relation to the rule of law. I provided advice to the US Congress and Senate on the, the securing of US borders against the use of weapons of mass destruction for terrorist purposes. And I have more recently been the chief planner for the European Union common security and defense policy in Brussels, covering specifically Ukraine, Georgia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and more latterly, or more earlier rather, Libya. I am now the UKIP candidate for police and crime commissioner in Kent. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU's efforts, and I speak with some experience here, to coordinate the diplomacy of its member states rather than leave it to member states themselves to coordinate amongst themselves, does, contrary to some opinions, reduce the influence and the voice of those states in the international security field. In the OSC that I've already mentioned, for example, every month there is a permanent council meeting in which all the 57 now members, uh, participating state ambassadors gather. The protocol is that the, EU, the European Union ambassador acts as a coordinator for a common EU policy statement for each agenda point at the Permanent Council. The EU ambassador reads out that common statement, which is the compromise and conglomeration, if you like, of the opinions of all 28 member states. And in the words of the EU ambassador, it is often vacuous. The EU member states during the subsequent debate cannot speak, or very rarely speak, because you cannot coordinate your foreign policy in a debate prior to saying what you want to say. The voice of the European Union is quiet, the voice of its EU member states are quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU's persistent centralising character and the consensual decision-making processes that it applies undermine strategic initiative and timely, clear and decisive leadership, all of which are required in a crisis or security situation. The EU's bureaucracy, its guidelines, procedures and regulations undermine, undermine responsiveness and encourage mediocrity. The EU is unable to, to secure its external borders and unwilling to secure its internal borders. As any police or intelligence officer will tell you, criminals and terrorists will seek to exploit freedom of movement between different law enforcement jurisdictions. And yet, at the same time, the European Union prevents us, the United Kingdom, from taking fully independent actions to secure our own borders from the threats that the European Union, with its policies, has allowed to reach the, our neighboring shores. So if you ask me, ladies and gentlemen, whether Britain is safer outside the European Union, I am unambiguously clear. Yes, Britain is safer outside the European Union. <laughs> However, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to carry on much further um, at this moment. What I'd like to do is introduce a short video uh, for you all to have a, a quick look at, which rather sums up the situation. Thank you. And now for the EFDD group, Mr. Farage. Thank you. Four years ago, I stood here and said that bombing Libya would be a huge mistake. Uh, but of course, the UK Parliament and this Parliament were desperate. There was a clamour uh, to go to war. And so now we have a failed state of Libya, uh, which is now a conduit being used for criminal trafficking gangs trying to bring people to Europe. We are guilty for this crisis. We are directly guilty for the drownings that are going on. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is this. 
the definitions for who qualifies for asylum are so wide they include not just people coming from war, not just people coming from failed states. Mr Juncker this morning seemed to suggest that perhaps it would even include people who were fleeing poverty. I'm sorry, we simply can't accept countless millions. Already in countries like mine, 77% of the population say we cannot take immigration at current levels. But there is a real and genuine threat. When ISIS say they want to flood our continent with half a million Islamic extremists, they mean it. And there is nothing in this document that will stop those people from coming. Indeed, I fear we face a direct threat to our civilization if we allow large numbers of people from that war torn region into Europe. I promise my party will stand up to this impending disaster for all concerned. I fear we face a direct threat to our civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Nigel Farage, leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party. Well, good morning, everybody. And I think in the shape of Henry Bolton, we must have the best qualified candidate for Police and Crime Commissioner for any party in the entire United <laughs> Kingdom. And perhaps it is that change in the calibre of people in UKIP. Um, no longer are we the party being accused of harbouring extremists. <laughs> but it is that improvement in the calibre of people in UKIP and the fact that we have refused to shy away from the most imminent and urgent threat and problem that faces this country, namely open door immigration and the security and social implications of it. Perhaps it's for those reasons that yesterday um, YouGov said that if there was a general election tomorrow, there are six million people that would go out and vote UKIP, a record high in the history of our party. But I'm here today to talk more about the referendum campaign. And two weeks ago, the Electoral Commission <coughs> gave official designation to the Leave and the Remain side. And what we've seen from the Remain side has been a remorseless torrent of propaganda scaring us and warning us that if we weren't part of this European Union, our economy would be in dire trouble. We've had the Treasury uh, forecasting what the economy would be in 2030 which, given their quarterly forecasts are always wrong, perhaps doesn't hold much water. And the entire international community has clubbed together um, all sorts of overpaid, useless people at the International Monetary Fund and the OECD. <laughs> and we even had President Obama coming to the country <laughs> parroting the number 10 line and, of course, the key was when he said that Britain would be at the back of the queue. Americans don't use the word queue. They say line, which just about to me proved the point. He was saying what Cameron had asked him to do. But as a result of this remorseless torrent, the Leave campaign, the official Leave campaign, has effectively spent the last fortnight defending its own goal, doing their best to stop the other side, putting the ball into the net decrying all that has been said as being nonsense, uh, but perhaps not being as assertive as they should be. And I'm very pleased that in the last few days, Professor Patrick Minford and others have stood up and said, not only is what the Romanians are saying rubbish, any of you get that? No, it's all right. <laughs> not only is what they're saying rubbish, but actually the deal, the trade deal that we have is a rotten deal. For tariff-free access to the single market, we have to accept the free movement of people. We have to accept a daily membership fee of £34 million a day. And for the fact that only 12% of the British economy is engaged in exports to the European Union, 
100% of our businesses have to accept EU regulation and law. And as Minford has said, outside of this single market, we'll be better off. Food will be cheaper, cars will be cheaper, and even the worst case scenario, which is that there is no deal, there is no successful conclusion of talks at the end of two years, even the worst case scenario, under WTO rules, the total amount of tariffs only amounts to two-thirds of our net contribution to this club. So we need to be much more assertive in making the economic point that Britain will be better off outside the European Union, whatever those negotiations lead to. But all of that is being in our half of the pitch. And as a family with a long-standing record, generations of supporting the Crystal Palace Football Club, who are now in the FA Cup final, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> well, we are in London. I thought I might have got some support for it. <laughs> what we need to do, what the Leave campaign needs to do, and what I have urged Vote Leave, the official designated vehicle, we have got to get into the other half of the pitch. We've got to start attacking the enemy's goal. And where the enemy are at their absolute weakest is on this whole question of open-door migration, the effect that it's had on the lives of ordinary Britons over the course of the last decade, and the threat that it poses given the new terror and security threat that we face in the West. I'm sorry to say that at the moment they don't appear to have done it. And they don't, within them, I think, have the credible voices to make those arguments. Because if you've been part of the Cabinet that has overseen net migration, and that's if you believe the official figures, which seem to be being corrected by the week, but if you're part of the Cabinet that has seen net migration running at record levels and running at ten times the post-war average, you're perhaps not best placed to make those arguments. I tried very hard over the course of this weekend to say, look, we must let bygones be bygones. Whatever has been said in the past is irrelevant. We need to be together. And I would love myself and UKIP to work with you on this campaign because actually we are the form horses when it comes to immigration, when it comes to the impact that it's had on people in this country. And I'm sorry to say uh, that every time I attempt to try and work with them, I am rebuffed and rejected. Well, fine. If they don't want us to be part of their campaign, we will make the arguments ourselves and we will, between now and June the 23rd, make one very simple point. When Theresa May says that it is difficult to control immigration as a member of the European Union, she's wrong. It isn't difficult, it's impossible. And the reason is all too clear. This is a British passport. And what are the first two words on it? European Union. Since the Treaty of Maastricht, we have been citizens of the European Union. And this passport is available to 508 million people. And yes, we're able, not being part of Schengen, to ask people to show their passport as they come through Dover, but there is nothing we can do to stop unlimited numbers of people from EU countries settling in this country and enjoying the same rights and privileges as all the rest of us. We warned in 2004 that letting in the former communist countries would lead not just to a total loss of control, but to an unprecedented flow into Britain. And we have been proved right. And yet, the Westminster set still haven't really clocked it. I guess it's because so many of them come from such privileged and wealthy backgrounds and so rarely ever dare stray outside the M25 that they... <laughs> that many of them think that open-door mass immigration is terrific. And in some ways, let's be honest, for them it is because it's cheaper nannies, and it's cheaper chauffeurs, and it's cheaper gardeners. And if you own a big business, be it in 
agriculture or manufacturing or building particularly you know it gives you access to unlimited amounts of cheap labor but the impact of this has been felt by ordinary decent people in this country just think about housing I mean, here we are in London with a massive massive housing crisis and we learn of course that the green belt the green belt that many of us love so much around London is now very directly under threat is it any wonder given current levels of immigration into Britain we have to build a new house every seven minutes just to cope with the current flow of people and what about primary school places with an explosion in the birth rate from newly arrived people we estimate that we're going to have to find another 200,000 primary school places by 2020 but I say estimate because the point is that good government is about planning forwards but how can you plan forwards for public service provision when you have open door immigration and you've no idea in five years time with the nearest two million how many people will actually be living in the country you can't as far as the National Health Service is concerned I did try last year in the general election to raise the issue of health tourism uh, but a simple fact is that last year the British government paid out 6.2 billion sterling to European hospitals that treated British patients and despite the fact there are many more EU nationals living in Britain than there are British nationals living in the EU for the 6.2 billion we sent in that direction how much came back to this country 405 million so whichever way you cut this we're getting a rotten deal in terms of the health service now I know the Chancellor will keep telling us that our GDP is going up but if your population increases by half a million a year it's not particularly surprising folks is it that your GDP goes up the question is is GDP per capita going up and it's not and Bank of England sources are perfectly clear that for ordinary working people on average salaries their real wages their real living standards have declined by 10 percent since 2008 and perhaps that's why there are so many people out there hard-working Britons out there that have been switching their political allegiance to us because they are the ones who paid the price for irresponsible open-door migration now there are many other things that we simply can't put a cost on social cohesion a sense in our cities or market towns that we are one community living together that of course has become increasingly divided fragmented segmented within our towns and cities because the sheer pace of people coming has been too great to integrate there are also big implications for crime you know the fact that 41 percent of registered crime in London is now committed by foreign nationals is I would suggest a source of concern and says to me that post Brexit what we need to do is to put in place an immigration and work permit scheme along the lines that countries like Australia put into place we want good people to come to our country we don't want to discriminate against them because they're from India or New Zealand in favor of Romania and Bulgaria we should be open to the world we should want people in sensible numbers with skills with trades who haven't got criminal records and are prepared to pay their own medical insurance for at least five years that is the future I believe <laughs> Now, Henry showed you a video just before I got up to speak, and that was on the 29th of April 2015. That is a year ago today that I went to Strasbourg. The general election was just a week later, and I did it in an attempt to make this a debate, to make this an issue in the general election. I have to tell you that I failed totally and utterly to do so. It was even said by one of the national broadcasters that I'd taken a break from the general election campaign but I was trying to warn that the European Union had embarked on a very bad and ill thought out project 
the common asylum policy that my friend Mr Juncker was putting into place this time last year went miles away from any traditional definition of what a refugee is. You know, a refugee is an individual or group of individuals who fear persecution because of their race, orientation, beliefs or religion. But the European Union has expanded that and extended that and effectively what Angela Merkel did in July of last year, which I think must rank as one of the worst decisions by a Western leader since 1945, to say we can take people in unlimited numbers has led, I'm afraid in those countries, to very grave consequences. You know, when the boss of Europol says there are up to 5,000 jihadis who've come into Europe in the last 18 months posing as migrants through the Greek islands, I believe him. When Sir Richard Dearlove, the former boss of MI6, says that we are far less safe, not controlling our borders, I believe him. And when Henry Bolton, who I used to walk past in the street in Brussels and assume he was one of them on the other side, <laughs> and when Henry Bolton says we'll have a safer Britain by taking back control of our borders, I believe him. But it isn't just about terrorism. There are some quite serious social implications in this too. As we saw outside that train station in Cologne on New Year's Eve, well, we saw the mass open sexual molestation of hundreds of women appearing in public. And frankly, if we're prepared to accept, or if Germany and Sweden are prepared to accept unlimited numbers of young males from countries and cultures where women are at best second-class citizens, then frankly, what do you expect? And it seems to me that it is the primary job of government to defend the realm and to look after the interests of its own people and to put those interests first. And I do not want those young men who were outside Cologne train station to have one of these in a few short years and to be able to come to our country. We are going to have to be very much more selective about who comes to Britain if we want to maintain our modern liberal traditions. And I know that we in UKIP will fight tooth and nail to fight and preserve that. And believe me, none of this is going to get better because the EU now are in negotiations with Turkey. And Mr Erdogan plays a clever game, doesn't he? He asks for 3 billion euros and says it's not enough and wants to double it up to 6 billion euros. The deal is that for every one we send back that doesn't qualify under the new definitions, they'll send us one in return. The numbers at the moment roughly, and I, and I got this from Mr Juncker the other day, who thinks the returns policy is a success, roughly in the last year, 1.8 million have come into the European Union and we've managed to send back 325. <laughs> and yet, Turkey's asking for more and more. And by October of this year, there will be a visa-free travel deal negotiated between the Schengen Zone and Turkey. In theory, people can only go into the EU or the Schengen Zone for 90 days, but in reality, large numbers will disappear or, of course, claim rights of family reunion. And now Mrs Merkel has decided that Turkey must become a member of the European Union by 2025 at the latest. So if you vote to remain, ladies and gentlemen, you're voting to go into a political union with Turkey. You are voting to go into a free travel area with 77 million people and rising fast in Turkey. I used to worry that we were living in an increasingly German-dominated Europe. But from what I can see, it might become a Turkish-dominated Europe. But I do have to commend Mr Erdogan for his negotiating skills, and it's a great pity that David Cameron didn't employ a Turk to do the job for him. <laughs> <laughs> for
For too long, in the minds of many people, the European question has been over here and the immigration and borders question has been over here. Increasingly, people are beginning to see them as one and the same. We have to, in this campaign, make people understand that EU membership and uncontrolled immigration are synonymous with each other. We have to make people understand that what this referendum is about is taking back control of our lives, our laws and our borders. We have to make people understand this may be the last opportunity we ever get to become a normal country once again. Over 180 countries control their borders and decide who is suitable to come and live and work and settle there. We have surrendered that to Brussels. We have surrendered that to a new concept of EU citizenship. I want us to take back control of our borders, our passports. I want us to live in a safer Britain. And I want us to treat immigration equally from anywhere in the world and not with a bias in favour of those coming from the EU. And if we get this right, we will mobilise people who are on the outside or potentially on the outside, we will mobilise them to turn out and vote on June the 23rd. If we get this issue right, we'll win the referendum and June the 23rd will become Independence Day. Thank you. Big man Tyrone here. Make sure to subscribe to the Wicked Awesome Robin Hood YouTube YouTube website. He exposes the leftist crops on the British Brainwashing Corporation. <laughs> nice. <laughs>